you. Thank you. So I'm starting my talk today with a pre-talk qualifier by sharing with you how I learned the organisms of life on Earth. You see the five kingdom system, starting with the animals on top, and of course us being included in that, plants next, then fungi, then the single-celled protists, and the lowest rung of the ladder, the lowly bacteria. I've also lived much of my life in contexts where men are listed first before women. And what I want to tell you about today is that I am literally going to flip this grid. To elevate the unseen. However, I want to emphasize to all the plants, all the animals, and all the men out there that you are important, you are valued, and you are loved. You are just not the subject of this TED Talk. <laughs> Because my job today is to tell you about the power of the unseen. And I'm going to do this first with a gift. A gift that was given to all of us. This is the gift. Now, some of you may be thinking, that ah, lady's a little off her rocker. She's carrying around a hunk of dirt. <laughs> and I would say, please, please think about your language. That's a very disrespectful and derogatory term. This is soil and it is full of life. For in just a teaspoon of this material, billions of bacteria, yards of fungal filaments, thousands of protozoans, hundreds of nematodes, and a few insects. In fact, nowhere else on Earth are species more numerous, more densely packed, or less understood than this environment. So we need to treat it with care, and preciousness, and we are going to elevate it and keep it visible right here through this talk. What we do know about that material is that it is powerful. And I want to tell you about that power, the power of the unseen. So first, let's make this a little bit more visible. The bacteria, the protozoans, fungi, nematodes, mites, in an example of an insect. So this is a community that actually collaborates in community to achieve the functions that I'm going to tell you about today. And it's also in conjunction with plants. So here you see a plant root coming down with hairs extended. And because plants take f up to 40% of their photosynthetic power, they deliver it down through their roots and out of their roots. Why? To support this community, feed it, care for it, who would you give your 40% of your income to? Only something that is of critical importance. Plants know this. What is this critical importance? So they, this material that they send down to the bacteria, the bacteria builds glue with. Glue that will hold those soil particles together and create architecture in the soil. That architecture and the holding together of the soil prevents erosion. That architecture also creates this, what I'd like you to think about as a circulatory system. So if you took a scan of this core, this would be something close to what it would look like. So these blue areas, those are open spaces. Vessels would be a good way to think about them. What's moving through there? Water and air. The water, the vessels allow it to go back off that water. When it is in a heavy rain, it takes it up instead of it leaving and taking other things with it. The water also it has holding capacity, and it will give it back when it's dry. The air also penetrates, providing critical oxygen for all of these organisms and very much for the plant roots that need it. This is also the largest water purification system on Earth. Our groundwater, our surface water runs through it, cleans it. These organisms also work together to literally make nutrient cycles go round so that all of those nutrients are available to them and to other life. They capture and store carbon. Three times the carbon in the atmosphere is held in the soil. And a lesser known, the vast majority of the antibiotics that we use today are produced by these soil microbes. So if you take nothing else away from this slide, take this. The life below makes the life above 
possible. And we are losing it at alarming rates. In the Midwest, so this is accumulation of data, this is just the latest, just came out in February. We're losing soil at 10 to 1,000 times faster than it's made, which by the way is very slow. And across the U.S. Corn Belt, a third of the topsoil has already been lost. What is topsoil, you might ask? This is topsoil, the uppermost layer, deep, rich, black, organic, and full of life, where so much of this power is held. We can see it. This is a shot, an aerial shot of northern Iowa, and you can see these mounds that are lighter in color. They've already lost their topsoil. This is Winnesheet County, Iowa, where I live, where things are much more highly erodible. This was after a rainstorm. That is not a stream. There's not supposed to be water there. There are areas here where an inch or two of soil has been lost in one rainstorm. Climate change is making this worse, so it's well documented now. The raindrops are coming harder and they're coming faster. So this is m very much exacerbating the vulnerability and the, and the problem. So the projections of soil depletion in Iowa look like this. This is based on site-specific data, but if this level of erosion was universally happening across the state, here's the time that we've got left. This would be if we're losing at 10 times the rate that it's formed, and we'd get to somewhere out here. This is the rate if we're losing it at 50 times faster than it's formed, and this is 100 times. So many of the models are in these sorts of ranges. These sorts of years, we're not talking a couple hundred years here. We're talking 20, 40. And this is not only happening in Iowa. This is happening across the world. So this shows a world map uh, where soils are degraded with all of the pink areas the most degraded. And the mo highest concern here is that many of these areas, like we're in the Midwest here, they are where the richest soils are that we need for producing food. So why are we losing soil? We need to ask this question. We are damaging the unseen life that lives here. How are we doing that? In most of agricultural areas, for half the year, the non-growing season, there is an absence of living plants and roots on that ground, and the absence, therefore, of the support that is needed for these organisms. And even if there are plants there, there are not very many different types or animals. Why is that important? Because these things need different types of food, and they need different types of things delivering the different types of food. So if, if not everybody has their right food source, there could be fallout, and then the community doesn't function as well, or, not, or perhaps at all. The other thing we do, we disturb this architecture that's so vital by things like tillage and compaction and chemicals. And the other thing that happens is, even if there are plants there, much of that soil is still bare, as, as you can see here, between the corn rows, creating vulnerabilities. So they're still sensitive to rain, heat, and cold. These are all things that do damage to these organisms. So what would this feel like, look like on human terms? I want you to imagine this. Once a year, at least, a tornado comes through your house and your community and just levels it and at the same time takes out all the transportation systems. You needed to get food in and, and waste out. And then you need to recover from that, but you're having a hard time because you're starving for half the year, and if you do have some food, it's only some types of food, so not every member of your community makes it. And then you're doing this without a house over your head, so you're getting pummeled with rain and heat and cold. Would we make it? We would not. They aren't either. We can fix these things. So that's a major message today. We can fix them. We know how to do it. It's the reverse of things that were just happening that is harming them. There's a soil revolution happening. There are major innovations happening to restore the unseen. It can be done. We know this. How do we know this? Because there are indigenous communities that have been doing this, sustainable agriculture, for thousands of years. Still doing it. The ones that didn't do it, that didn't have their eyes focused on protecting this life, don't exist anymore. So the question is, how fast is it happening? 
Is it happening fast enough? Let's take a look at our own state here of Iowa. Almost the entire state of Iowa is farmed. 90% of the state is in two crops. So 90% of that land is also bare for half the year. And some version of a tornado comes through it in about two thirds of the land. So what we need to do is radically increase those green areas fast. And so how, what's needed to do that? We need systems and incentives to radically support farmer innovators that are doing regenerative agriculture. We need an engaged public that is willing to invest in this, not, and it's not just about the farmers, it's about all of us. And we need everyone to be included, everyone. Just like those organisms that are operating in sync together, like we need all hands on deck here. And so the question is, are we including everyone? Women own nearly half the land in Iowa and the majority of rented farmland. And yet, they are hard to find, it turns out. So this is a plat map. So these are available, they're sent to you free all over any rural landowner. And it shows where everybody lives and what their acres are. And we were using this on a water quality project I was involved in um, as we were working on it. And we were literally writing names on envelopes to tell landowners about the project, about some resources, about money we had to, that they could use for some of those practices. And they were all going out to men. And I was the only female sitting at the table and I said, can we please include the woman's name so that they know they're included, the woman landowner. And they said, we don't know their names. And we're using the plat map. And so let me just read you the names on this plat map on the bottom row. Dale, Ken, Roger, Lloyd, John, John, Mark, Robert, Francis, Paul, Stephen, Lonnie, Kevin, David, Dale, and William. Women are literally invisible on the map. And I, call, I called the plat map company and I got all the way up to the CEO eventually and I said, this is what we're trying to do, we're struggling, we need to know their names, why aren't they on the plat map? And he said, well, you know, we only have limited space. We just take the first name listed on the property deed, and it's almost always the male. Data on women attitudes and behaviors about land conservation and ownership um, and attitudes is also lacking. So this is just one example. This is a statewide farmer survey that's ongoing for six years now, major part of an initiative for water quality improvements, millions of dollar projects, um, 96 to 98 percent male. And I asked, why is that? And it's because the survey just goes to land operators, not landowners. So it misses the women. So if you do look at studies on women landowners, you can find them, at least some, that focus on this. You'll find this. Compared to men, women had significantly lower levels of knowledge about conservation practices, but more positive attitudes about both conservation and, importantly, collaboration. Compared to men, women report less self-efficacy and confidence related to conservation, and importantly, lack of a social or professional conservation network. And finally, ethnography data suggests that the historic omission of women's contributions to agriculture is compromising their access to these resources and the networks. And importantly, some hints that women may not value land in the same way as men. They favor restoration of land for the greater community as a, in contrast to commodity. Women do care about this. So let's hear from a few right here locally in Winnipeg County that I've interviewed. You know, God's plan is to have something always on that soil. That's, that's why I'm a small scale farmer. And uh, now I see farming as a thing that really, my role is to, um, to help connect people to the earth, to what's going on. It was better than having him rented out because he would worry about are they getting this, the planting done early enough in the spring? Are they getting the crops in in the fall? <laughs> this way he doesn't have to worry about any crops. <laughs> it's all here. <laughs> right? <laughs> no insecticides or anything going on it. No pesticides. I was a woman and I didn't know that much about farming it was just ideal for me. I didn't have to worry about renters. I didn't have to worry about what was being done with the land. And now I think be more concerned about plowing it all up again. I just, you know, 
I just wouldn't like to see that done. <laughs> I like it. I like the land. A couple more women that are closely connected to me. This is my grandma, Eileen Savageau, started farming when she was 20 years old, lost granddad at age 59, and for 26 years was the sole landowner of this 160-acre farm in Delaware County, Iowa. My mom grew up disappointed. Why? She was not born a boy. She said, well, I watched my mom do like full participation in this whole operation, and then I watched her come in and do everything else. This is my mom, picture taken two weeks ago. She's 85 years old and she's the 50-year co-owner of a 300-acre cow-calf farm in Joe Davies County, Illinois. She has spent her entire life caring for this land, her family, and definitely these cows. And this shows you various states of age and joy and also despair. But the reason that I include it here is that last week, my 85-year-old mother met with the conservation professionals for the NRCS and the USDA for the very first time so that she can try to figure out how to care for this land. She hasn't been included in the network and the information and the history, and there's catching up to do. So my hypothesis that I would like to share with you summarizing this talk is that unseen women offer the greatest potential to save our soil and restore, restore the power to this unseen life-giving universe beneath our feet. What would success look like? It would save our ability to continue to produce food. It would save our water because the, what's happening now is the, resulting in the greatest contaminants in our water. And it would help save our planet because this soil has lost a whole bunch of carbon and it has the capacity to suck that back up if we regenerate it and help us with climate change. So what can you do if you are a woman landowner? Use your position of power to save the life in our soil. And it most definitely is a position of power. And if you are their spouse, include them and support them. Connect women with the local women landowner conservation network in your community. And finally, ask for what you need to save this precious life and everything else that depends on it. Thank you.